Back in 2007, Crytek would release its first-person shooter franchise named Crisis. The game would later become solidified as a cultural icon, with many asking the question, but can it run Crisis in relation to PC hardware? At the time that Crisis released, it was one of the most graphically demanding games and originally designed to be played only on PC. Crisis, at its highest settings and resolutions, required power from computers that simply were not really there when it first released. We've since come a long way from 2007, and we're on the RTX 40 series of NVIDIA graphics cards, so of course, the world is very different technologically now than it was then. Most people had already seen what Crytek could do with its Cry engine back with the first Far Cry game, so naturally the successor engine called CryEngine 2 was, naturally expected, to be an amazing game engine as well. Now, 16 years later, Crisis sits in a different world for video games. Games. games today are pushing boundaries on graphics, gameplay, and more. 2023 itself was one of the biggest and best years for video gaming yet, with releases like Baldur's Gate 3, Spider-Man 2, Alan Wake 2, the Resident Evil 4 remake, and so much more. So of course, this begets the question, how does Crisis hold up in an era like today's? How does Crisis stack up in relation to 2023's lineup, or really, in relation to modern video gaming in general? Because let's face it, 16 years is quite a long time, especially when we're talking about technology. I mean, it's crazy, but I remember back when regular laptops were massive bricks, and today we've got laptops that don't even weigh like 2 pounds. It's insane. So with all that aside, let's take a bit of a trip back to 2007 and talk about Crisis, the game that pushed computers to their limits. But more specifically, let's take a look at the evolution of how Crisis became the franchise that it's known as today. Crytek's CryEngine was one of the most complex and intricate game engines to ever be made. And back when it was first used on Far Cry, it was clear that Crytek wasn't just making games, they were pushing boundaries. So it came as no surprise that they would again try to push the boundaries of what PCs can handle with their 2007 release of Crisis, utilizing an updated version of the engine known as CryEngine 2. Crisis, although developed specifically for PCs, was so demanding that basically no consumer PCs and gaming laptops at the time could handle running Crisis at its most demanding settings. Back when Crisis was developed, the game was extremely complex. It required one gigabyte of texture data and an upwards of 85,000 shaders. In addition, the entire code for Crisis spanned over 3,000 pages with one million lines of code. If you've ever coded a single line, even if it's just as basic as hello world, you will know that coding is no simple task. Today, this may not sound like much, but the landscape of 2007 was different. That much is clear. Sure, around 2007, we also got amazing games like Assassin's Creed and Halo 3 and The Elder Scrolls Oblivion, and I still consider 2007 to basically be the golden age of gaming, but Crisis pushed the envelope even beyond those other games. It was a game made to run on the best machines out there. But if we look back at Crytek's earlier days, it's pretty clear that they've been pushing the envelope for a while. The German company was started by the three Yerli brothers in 1993, who still maintain ownership today. At the time, they would create demos for PC games, with an early project of theirs being Exile Dinosaur Island. At E3 in 1999, the team promoted the demo, with NVIDIA being one of the first companies that the Yearly Brothers pitched their software to. At the time, their demo Exile was one of the most graphically advanced out there. It was considerably beautiful, with realistic lighting and more advanced techniques that, in 1999, weren't really so visible in the industry. NVIDIA absolutely loved the demo and figured that it would be an extremely beneficial way for them to promote the future GeForce graphics cards. So they struck a deal and in February of 2001, the GeForce 3 would release, using the X-Isle demo to showcase the immense abilities of the graphics card. Crytek exploded in popularity with the boost from NVIDIA's showcase, allowing for them to land a major contract with the French video game giant Ubisoft. 
This contract was, of course, to produce Far Cry, which would become Crytek's first AAA title in 2004. Far Cry at the time was a beautiful game, chock full of nature, vegetation, ocean, and more. Far Cry did relatively well with players, and Ubisoft would eventually kick it off as a franchise that is still going strong today. Although Crytek would not be responsible for the next Far Cry games, they set the stepping stones in place for the franchise. If you're interested more in Far Cry, you can check out our video talking about the evolution of Far Cry from 2004 to the recent Far Cry 6 release. The first Cry engine was thus owned by Ubisoft, and this engine would ultimately become the engine used for games like Assassin's Creed 2 and the following three Far Cry titles. However, Crytek was no longer working with Ubisoft and had instead moved under the banner of the mega video game giant Electronic Arts. Of course, I don't think I need to tell you about EA, but in case you're not so familiar with EA, they're the company behind Battlefield, The Sims, and pretty much every relevant sports video game out there. Crytek knew its goals and it knew them well. Make graphically demanding games. Of course, that's the simple version of it. 2007 was a very important year for gaming, as I mentioned a bit earlier, but it's mainly because 2007 started showing the industry and players what the future of gaming would look like. With open worlds becoming more commonplace, at least in terms of being advanced and very open, Bethesda's The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion would set a bit of a standard for players. However, Oblivion was a game designed to be multi-platform, something that put a dent in its ability to be a super graphically advanced video game. The PC version of the game was absolutely fantastic to play, but it was clear that it could have been more. Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare would also release in 2007, and it was an absolutely fantastic game that was built off of an engine based off of id Tech 3, which was used in Quake 3 Arena, of course with a lot of modifications. But even playing Modern Warfare today, you can see that the game is lacking graphically in many aspects. Plus, it's also multi-platform. Crisis was different though. Standing out as a PC exclusive, Crisis could afford to be very powerful. Crytek had already figured out how to get the ball rolling on graphically advanced games, so they just need to take that to the next level with Crisis. CryEngine 2 was a very powerful engine that could handle things like dynamic lighting and shadowing, HDR rendering, support for multi-CPU and GPU systems, and dynamic and destructible environments, and so much more. So the stage was set, and 2007 was around the corner. Crisis is classified as a military sci-fi first-person shooter. Developed by Crytek, of course, and published by EA, Crisis takes place in the future, where a massive structure built by aliens has been discovered and buried inside of a mountain in the fictional Lingshan Islands off the coast of the Philippines. In a single-player campaign, you play as US Army Delta Force soldier Jake Dunn, referred to as Nomad. Pretty generic call sign, but it's a military game after all. Throughout Crisis, you fight against North Korean soldiers and alien enemies in many environments across Lingshan. Crisis immediately jumps right into the action, with you dropping out of a transport ship onto the island, and instantly you can tell that this game is going to be something else. Despite the fact that Crisis was released in 2007, it still looks impressive in terms of its graphics. Gameplay in Crisis is pretty interesting, because although it does follow the basics of what a first person shooter would be, which is to have first person shooting, Crisis integrates the sci fi elements nicely into the gameplay, making it a smooth and fun experience. With the futuristic nano suits worn by the soldiers in Crisis, you can employ some unique gameplay features like maximum armor, which preserves your health during shootouts, a cloaking mechanism for stealth and sneaking past enemies, and super speed bursts so that you can sprint to a location you're urgently trying to get to. You can also long press to get a high jump so that you can scale taller rocks and structures. These things all add on to the gameplay a lot and makes for a very interesting sci-fi experience. And as a huge sci-fi fan, having these elements really gave the gameplay a much more unique feeling than other first-person shooters I've played before. In addition to this, you can really see CryEngine 2 work its magic in this game, because it really does have a different feel to it. CryEngine truly excels in its production of vegetation, which I think can make or break a game that looks realistic versus a game that doesn't look realistic. In the middle of gameplay, you can customize attachments on your guns in order to change the way you play. For instance, you can add silencers in order to stay stealthy when taking down enemies or to avoid alerting too much attention to your position. 
You can add different sights and even a laser to your pistol for more accurate aiming. It's neat that you can do this mid-game and it does look a lot like the same system that Battlefield 2042 uses for the weapon customization mechanic. There's a binocular system as well that allows for you to perform a bit of stealthy recon before you engage the enemy in a more densely populated area or in an area with a lot of buildings. Obviously with more structures in the way, it's better for stealth, but it's also dangerous because enemies can be hiding out anywhere. Almost all vehicles strewn about the map can be used, which is fun because you can just blast through a checkpoint, a pickup truck, or something crazy like that and just because you can. I've done it and it's fun. But it also shows that the world is relatively dynamic as well. Crisis includes destructible environments, which is absolutely fantastic because destruction in maps adds a lot more to the realism aspect of the game. I think it's a bit jarring sometimes when you can't have things get destroyed in first person shooters. For the most part, Crisis did a revolutionary thing in relation to video game graphics. As you play, vegetation responds to you, the environment feels alive, textures are absolutely phenomenal for their time, it shows in the graphical nature of the game. Story wise, Crisis may not have the greatest in terms of that because it's really a lot of nomad do this or nomad do that or nomad destroy those tanks, that sort of thing. However, the overarching plot of the crisis world is pretty interesting as it involves some cool stuff like aliens. So if you're a fan of military sci-fi, then it's really interesting on that front. The multiplayer aspect of crisis was originally another part of the crisis game, but the servers would unfortunately shut down in 2014 with the shutdown of GameSpy, which used to be a provider of online multiplayer game servers. While it was still a Live, the Crisis multiplayer was relatively similar to most other first person shooter multiplayer modes. Still, it existed and was pretty popular. Spinning off from the first Crisis game is Crisis Warhead. With a side plot parallel to the first Crisis game, Crisis Warhead would follow another character you meet in the first game. As you play as Nomad in Crisis, Psycho, a colleague of yours, is going through his own stuff on the other side of the island. So Warhead delves into that parallel Psycho storyline. Compared to the first game, Warhead featured new customizable weapons, new vehicles and enemies, and some new multiplayer content. It used a newer version of CryEngine 2 and had similarly exciting and interesting gameplay. Crisis Warhead did get a lot of praise from critics who loved the movement and abilities. Of course, seeing as it is still a Crisis game, it was really good on the gameplay front. However, people were annoyed at how short the story mode was and how little innovation Warhead brought to the table compared to Crisis. There have been some claims that the original source code for Crisis Warhead has since been lost, which may be why Crisis Warhead never got that same remastered treatment that the other Crisis games got. Whether that's true or not, as it stands, Crisis Warhead's remastered version doesn't seem to be coming anytime soon in the near future. Crisis Warhead also seems to be lesser known compared to the other three mainline Crisis games, so perhaps interest in Warhead has fizzled out since. In any case, Crisis Warhead at its time in 2008 was still highly praised and won several awards from major video game news and review publications. Moving away from Nomad and the Jungle Island, Crisis 2 would release in 2011 and introduce an urban-based map. The first game to use the newer CryEngine 3, Crisis 2 was a gorgeous game and a testament to the graphical advancements of the Crisis franchise. Crytek at the time wanted to move away from the jungle environment after doing it for both Far Cry and Crisis 1, so they created a map of New York City with some newer aspects to the gameplay. Crisis 2 introduces a newer nano suit with upgraded features. Suit functionality became much simpler, with multiple modes being used simultaneously if the player wishes. The suit's strength and speed modes were combined into the new power mode. The suit's binoculars also come with a tactical mode. The cloaking device was modified and renamed stealth mode and allowed for players to use silent stealth melee kills on enemies, a much needed improvement to the stealth gameplay in my opinion. Crisis 2 pushes away from the North Korean threat and introduces a new human threat in the CryNet systems, who want to retrieve the suit that you use. I won't really say how you gain the suit, as that would be a pretty big spoiler. The aliens from Crisis are back, but do have a newer, more improved and updated form. The aliens also unlock some new gameplay elements, as collecting alien tissue lets you modify the nano suit to add some new power-ups and things of that nature. With Crisis 2, Crytek wanted to make the game run on more systems while still being more graphically 
technologically advanced and more advanced in regards to the gameplay. In my personal opinion, of the three mainline Crisis games, Crisis 2 is my favorite. I suppose I prefer the urban environments, but I think the graphical and gameplay advancements made in Crisis 2 were definitely something needed and welcomed. Crisis 2 also includes a killer virus that is absolutely gruesome. This killer virus has caused a breakdown of all social order in New York City. There was a multiplayer mode as well, but similar to the fate of Crisis 1's multiplayer, the servers would go down with GameSpy. Crisis 2 featured an insanely awesome soundtrack by bringing in soundtrack geniuses like Hans Zimmer and Lauren Balf to help Borislav Slavov and Tillman Selescu. You can tell that the theme song for Crisis 2 was composed by Hans Zimmer and Balf, and it is very much in line with the style of Zimmer because if you compare it to another Zimmer video game soundtrack, that being Modern Warfare 2 2009, it has that same dramatic and awesome flair. Crisis 2 did feel a bit more like a Call of Duty style shooter, but that does make sense. Call of Duty as a game has really left a permanent mark on the first person shooter genre and has really shaped the way military shooters are played and enjoyed. I mean, in the same year as Crisis 2 was the original Modern Warfare 3, and that game also featured an urban shooter setting at the beginning that had similarities to Crisis 2. Crisis 2 benefited from its graphical excellence and extremely destructible environments. Plus, it's a sci-fi shooter and not a realistic military shooter. But Crisis 2 did feel more like a Call of Duty experience. That may be partly why I enjoyed it, but I still loved playing Crisis 2. I do agree with some of the reviewers in that the story was okay. It wasn't as compelling as other military shooters, but it wasn't bad. Though some of the dialogue was pretty silly. If I had to compare the story in Crisis 2 to Modern Warfare 3, for instance, just because they released in the same year, I'd have to say Modern Warfare 3 wins on that section. Still, Crisis 2 was an insanely beloved game and sold a bit over 3 million copies. Crisis 2 was embroiled in a bit of some interesting drama when a beta version of the game was leaked online and pirated by a lot of people. It's not known if the leak was a hack or internal, but the leak happened and it really threw Crytek off. It wasn't ultimately damaging to the game's future sales, but it definitely did not sit well with Chivat Yerli as the beta leaked version was obviously a less polished and more buggy version of the full release of the game. In fact, Crisis 2 was one of the the most pirated games of 2011 with over 3.9 million pirated downloads. In 2013, Crisis 3 would release and it would be the most graphically advanced and most beautiful release in the Crisis franchise yet at least in terms of its visual quality. Set in post-apocalyptic New York, Crisis 3 took from the first two games and blended the urban jungle setting to become one. Crisis 3 improved on systems introduced in the first two games, including adding more of the original sandbox style of gameplay from Crisis 1 that was missing from the second Crisis game. Gameplay in Crisis 3 is relatively the same as the first two games, but the introduction of the compound bow changed the stealth game for Crisis. Crisis 2 would introduce more stealth mechanics that were missing from Crisis 1, but Crisis 3 would add a weapon specifically tailored and suited for stealth with the compound bow. The game includes seven levels, and each level can be beaten in a multitude of ways, with different routes available for tackling a single level. Crisis 3 also introduced some interesting technology-based features like hacking and alien tech that can be used by the player. Crisis 3's development budget was much smaller than Crisis 2 because around the exact same time, Crytek was working on Homefront 2 and Rise Son of Rome, a game that I talked about not too long ago. You can watch my video on Rise Son of Rome after this video if you want. Crisis 3 works for a more emotional delivery than Crisis 2, which had featured a mute protagonist. Crisis 3 instead features a speaking protagonist and the developers were trying to go for a connection between the player and the characters. In addition to this, Crytek used performance capture to record movements and facial expressions, something that has become very popular in the first person shooter genre as of late, as is evidenced by Call of Duty's latest game. Crisis 3 was built using the CryEngine 3, which got new features like volumetric fog shadows, improved dynamic vegetation, and more. Crisis 3 was going to push the limits on PC gaming and required a video card that could run DirectX 11. This came after Crisis 2 was criticized for being too light due to limitations on older console hardware. However, Crisis 3 was not the most loved of the trilogy by critics. Many liked the animations and the map, as well as the deeper stealth support, however, the story wasn't 
really that beloved. The Crisis 3 story was considered a bit weak and short, additionally others didn't feel like there was enough character development. Some digressed, but such is the nature of reviewers. Some critiqued Crisis 3 for not being ambitious enough and that it didn't really revolutionize anything beyond the safe spaces of the trilogy. Crisis 3 felt a bit more in line with Call of Duty's campaign styles to some. However, Crytek's CEO considers Crisis 3 the best game made by the studio thus far, but it failed to meet EA's sales expectations. In 2020, Crisis would get a remaster that was self-published by Crytek itself with Saber Interactive helping. It would also get a Nintendo Switch version, which is pretty crazy considering just how graphically intense Crisis is. Crisis 2 and 3 were also given some updates and included in the Crisis Remastered trilogy, but each updated version of the game could be purchased separately. Back in 2022, Crytek announced that there would be a Crisis 4 over on social media. However, not much else is known about Crisis 4. No official details were given on the story, the only thing that's really known is that the game is still in the very early stages of development. I can imagine though that it'll be another graphically powerful game and I'm sure with all the advancements made in graphics since 2013 that Crisis 4 will be one insanely beautiful looking game. There are of course speculations regarding what Crisis 4 will be like and I scoured the internet to see a few predictions. Some are assuming the game will return to a more jungle environment. I'm personally assuming that some improvements will be made to the nano suit and potentially even the stealth gameplay, as we did see the introduction of the stealth bow and arrow in Crisis 3, so I can't imagine that that won't be improved upon further. Others speculate they'll return to the more original sandbox gameplay style that was in the first Crisis, and less of the streamlined linear Call of Duty style stuff in Crisis 2. I think that'll be the case as well, as the popularity of open experiences in video games is certainly compelling for game production these days. Could it be like a Ubisoft style open world? I'm not sure. It's possible. Crisis is still one of the most socially influential games to ever release. It has solidified itself as a piece of history in the FPS genre. Its graphical capabilities were what gave it its claim to fame, but beyond its graphics, Crisis is a franchise that has evolved, yet still maintained its identity, and maintained its excellent gameplay. I think that Crisis is likely one of my most favorite franchises that I've played because it truly satisfies that desire for exciting first-person shooter campaigns that I've been wanting. Although there are some outdated elements, you can't deny that it's still a relatively beautiful game. And I'm happy to report that my PC can indeed run Crisis. With that being said, thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed that video, feel free to leave a like and subscribe with notifications set to all so you never miss out on a single upload. Comment below your thoughts on Crisis, and don't forget to check out our website for gaming news, entertainment, and more. The link to that as well as all of our other links are in the description below. See you all in the next video.